Okay, good morning, everybody. All right, let's all rise up. And um, to start, I'm going to do a little audience participation with you because it's such a gorgeous day. And yesterday, God's given us such beautiful. I'm going to start with a, the first verse of a psalm, and I know all of you are, no, are no, going to know how to finish it. Okay, you all ready? This is the day the Lord has made. Amen. Gosh, I love that. That's from Psalms. So, Lord, we do rejoice in this day. We receive your blessing this day, Lord. We open our hearts now, and we invite you to come and saturate this place, Holy Spirit. Amen, everyone? Amen. We say yes, Lord. We say yes, Holy Spirit. We open this place to you, honor you with, and value your presence here, and ask you to permeate this place with your empowering presence. Amen, everyone. Amen. Death, no life, no Things in the future, height, nor death, nor any creator. Thing could separate me from your love. Just no power, present things, nor things in the future. 
stop there. If you sense a shout it out, if you feel it. Yes.
to the service and get wasted. <laughs> Be glad you don't have my job. <laughs> I was uh, <laughs> driving in today and I put Christian Radio on. I was listening to uh, Matt Marr singing Run to the Father. <sighs> Don't drive and listen to that song. <clears throat> I thought was I was okay until we sang the song that has the verse that goes, come to the altar. There was a period in my life, sorry, Fred. <laughs> there was a, a period in my life when when I felt like I couldn't come to the altar. I felt unworthy. Sometimes I felt unclean. And when I did that, when I felt that way, I didn't pray. I didn't come to the Lord for my prayer time. I wanted to, but I couldn't. <sighs> then one day, I don't even remember what it was, whether I was listening to a talk on the radio or whether it was a sermon, but something Something was said by someone, and basically it was, that's a time when you need God most. And I heard it in my ears, and it went through my head, but it went right to my heart. And I haven't had that problem since. <laughs> Amen. So if that's you, if that's you, I want to pray for you right now. Father, you know every heart, every heart in this room. You know where they're at. In this sovereign moment, I ask that you come right now, right here, and touch the hearts that need to be touched, the hearts that need to know, that, that need to know that you are a loving father. And each one of these children of yours, not one of them can do anything they can't think of anything. They can't do anything that would separate them from you. And your desire is that they come to your altar, that we come to your altar every day of our lives. And I pray that you would do that for them right now in the way you have done it, for, as you have done it for me. Thank you, Lord. Wow, you are so good. So good. Yes, Lord. Thank you, worship team. <laughs> that was worth it all right there. And thank you, our media folks who make things happen for us uh, every week. Um, well, so I apologize. I did not have time this week to fix our projector. <laughs> so, so that's why most people are sitting on, on the left side of the church. <laughs> um, we'll try to get it done this week. It, 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 it's a two-man job, so if there's someone, two-person job, I'll take a woman. I, don't, I'm not, uh, I need a time this week. You know, It takes about an hour to take it down, replace the bulb and then put it back up. So if I could have someone volunteer, that would be great. Okay, as we prepare to receive our offering, uh, 
These are the words of Jesus. This is not Bob or Fred or Dave talking. Give generously, and generous gifts will be given back to you, shaken down to make room for more. Abundant gifts will pour out upon you with such an overflowing measure that it will run over the top. The measurement of your generosity becomes the measurement of your return. I know what I've, that I've said this before uh, many times. Uh, we could have testimony Sunday of people's, uh, uh, of, of what God has done in people's lives, you know, as they open their hearts and open their wallets and open their, uh, they're just generous with what God has given them and how much more God has done uh, for us. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a tremendous blessing. All right. Go ahead, uh, ushers, you can uh, do your thing, and I'll try to do announcements. Uh, Okay, I can't see over the podium. I'm not tall enough. Okay, Uh, so today, because it's Communion Sunday, we're going to be doing a uh, brunch after the service. Uh, We'll... Uh, so, so I'm going to speak to this side of the church. You've heard me say it a hundred times before. Right after the service, take your fellowship over to this side and uh, grab all your stuff because all of these red chairs are going to get moved up and the brown chair, blue chairs are going to come out along with tables. And if I could have a few people to help with that, that would be wonderful. Next Sunday, our brother Rich Brink will be with us to uh, minister to us. Yay. Always good to have Rich around. Mr. Revivalist himself. On May the 29th, we're having our Pentecost Festival, and there will be uh, information in the bulletins in the next few weeks about where, when, how, and all of that kind of stuff. That'd be good stuff. Also, we um, uh, made our offering uh, to the uh, people of Ukraine, um, and uh, we sent over $2,000 over to uh, Anton... Antonovich's uh, congregation, well, his former congregation, um, and uh, and yeah, that's it. Now, there's one more thing that is uh, equally important about all of these other announcements. Somebody is celebrating a birthday today, and it's our beloved Pam. Stand out, Pam. Come on, come on. Join with me. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Pam. Happy birthday to you. It's, it, it's actually an anniversary of her 39th birthday, but I'm not telling you which one. And now, without further ado, Lynn Meckley is going to give us her testimony today. You want that up there? Yeah, I think I'll put it in there. Thanks. I'm sorry, I'm going to be speaking about Almahum, a, a dead person today. And um, so forgive me, because it's sort of like the uh, tradition in the next people group from where I work, the Bataks. After about seven years after somebody's died, they go exhume the body, find, try to find the bones, wash them, dry them, have a prayer meeting, and then they rebury them with the other ancestral plot. So... All right, be ready. I'm digging in here 50 years ago, my life. How I came to Jesus Christ, how he pulled me in. (laughs) I was not the catch. I I was a mess. (laughs) Uh, Okay, here we go. Um, Oh, you're going to change it. Please click. So thank the Lord. I was born into a wonderful family. That was my dad built brick by brick this house. As I was born, he started building this house for us in York, Pennsylvania. And um, I, they were loving parents and they loved each other. They were um, people of integrity. And I really am thankful that I was born into that family. Um, 
I was one that was a little sensitive to fairness, and of course, parents don't aren't always fair. We know. I would write my mother notes at times. Um, Mom, I love you. Put it on her pillow. But if she did something that I thought was really unfair, how do you spell hate? I hate you, and put it on her pillow. <laughs> and uh, oh, so she knew where I stood. Anyway, so I grew up pretty normal, dorky kid. You can, I guess, you can click the next one. And, uh, you know, just normal life. And uh, then when I, we moved to Timonium when I was 10, and there was a group of people like my age and older, about 60 people uh, at least, that were headed for trouble. <laughs> and I joined right in. Started smoking cigarettes at, at 10, and then at 13 we started having field parties across from Jennifer Estate. Uh, you know, lots of alcohol and just starting to go down a path that was um, in conflict with what I knew was right. And of course, then when I knew it wasn't right, I started lying all the time. I started taking a bus to Towson to do shoplifting every Saturday. Um, I know, I'm shocking you all, so <laughs> sorry. <laughs> My BC life was not pretty. Um, but uh, and my friends were everything to me. And I, an adventure and friends. I hated sleeping. I wanted to be out and about with my friends all the time. The only conversations I had with my mother was screaming when we first, when I come home from the bus, uh, your room's a mess, you smell like cigarettes, ah, I'm getting out of here. And I'd run out the door and not come home until it's time to sleep. And just getting further and further into the world. And I started separating myself drastically from my family, didn't want to be around them. Um, and uh, it was, it was, this is in the 60s. So there was, people running away was a big deal then. There was, Haight-Ashbury was big. A lot of people had uh, fled. And I, you know, we all thought that was cool as teenagers. Well, my best friend, I had two friends, one up the street, one down the street. I went down the street, precious girl, she had a rougher, a rough situation at home in, in so many ways, and she ran away. Well, her father got the police and um, hunted her down, and we thought, oh, she's the hero, we're going to hide her, and this and that. Well, the rest of her, she never even graduated from high school. She ended up in ho group homes and detention centers. She was not a bad kid, but she, at one point, she, um, she made her way to Boston with her boyfriend, who was a uh, a hippie hitman for the mafia and invited me to join her. And I was like, yeah, I'm pretty ticked at my mom. I'm getting out of here. She arranged an underground and uh, for me to get up to Boston to join her. Um, she was sleeping on a flea bitten mattress that was uh, of the girl that was in the apartment under her that had been murdered. And um, beautiful situation I was gonna run into. But I thought I'd run down to the teen center to say goodbye to my friends before I left. Well. I could think of the guy's name, but he, we were playing, and I carry a basketball around with me because I go shoot baskets. So, uh, I like basketball. Anyway, so this guy at the basketball, I'm down the basketball court at Teen Center, and he thinks he's going to try to shoot a basket from one end of the court to the other. And he heaves this ball, and he doesn't hit the basket. He hits me. Thank God. He hit me. I had to be carried home. Didn't ever make it to Boston. Can you imagine? Thank you, Lord. Uh, and, uh, and then soon after that, I don't remember what, nothing happened. It was just all of a sudden I was the target for, um, to be completely ostracized from the gang. Completely ostracized. Nobody wanted to sit next to me on the school bus. They wrote nasty notes about me. Totally rejected. Wasn't invited. I was like at everything before that. And now I was totally not invited. And I spent my time crying in my room. I got ulcers. When I, had to get, I uh, wanted to commit suicide. I started contemplating the least painful way uh, to get out of this life and end it. I was like, I thought there was no purpose for living. Uh, and thankfully, and my, we had gone to church, maybe Lutheran growing up, and then when we moved to Timonium, we went to the same church as Ginny McKibben, uh, a Presbyterian church where nobody really knew Jesus. My parents didn't either, even though she, my mom was a Sunday school teacher, my dad was an elder in the church. And um, 
yeah, the pastor did some nasty thing to my dad, and then he quit going. Well, this is at the same time that I'm rejected, and I'm thinking, I have no other answer. God has to be the answer. Take, wake him up. Take me to church. I go to the Sunday school, and this the Sunday school teacher had quite a strange theology, but <laughs> she did help one more step in leading me to Christ. She gave me a guidepost magazine, and uh, it was on depression. And uh, I remember that it was two verses especially that I clung to and recited every day. Joshua 1, 9 and 10. Be strong, be courageous, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. And from Romans 8, 38, which we sang over and over today. If God is for you, who can be against you? And I would spend my time on the floor, like crying out to God. These are, these are true. You have to be there. I mean, it was months and months and months of this. Uh, ostracism. And I was like, how come you're not answering me? I, d I was looking for answers with one way. He was answering another. And thank God for his discipline. I thank God for his crushing. If he crushes Jesus, as it said in Isaiah 53, why wouldn't he crush us away to get us back to himself? I was killing myself. I was being struck, taken down the road with Satan who, who wants to destroy us. And he's on the rampage right now. And, uh, and we, you know, it's like, Jesus, thank you, Jesus. I think my paternal grandparents, thank God, they were praying for me because um, he, uh, he had mercy on me. So um, where am I? I'm about 14 or 15. And so thank the Lord. Um, oh, and then because I was always running, I really never slept, never slept. I hated sleeping. So um uh, I got pneumonia. Every spring I got some to think. In. So I got pneumonia this year, and while I'm lying in bed, I, I had a cro copy of the cr Cross and Switchblade. Cross and Switchblade. I was like, if you haven't read it, it was, you know, amazing. David Wilkerson leaves and goes up to the street gangs in New York, and it was, he's real. He's real. Jesus is real, and he's actually moving in, our, in the world still these days. I'd never heard that before. I would ask, I'd ask my mother as a kid, you know, why did Jesus die on the cross? And it was, you know, I don't know, and went to communicants class, asked the pastor about all these things, and he didn't, he didn't have the answers. I was like, wow, these people don't know. And then I read Cross and Switchblade. I was so excited to call up relatives did you know about Jesus and I started getting really excited so I'm thinking you know I'm I'm in with him but um I didn't really you know it was one step but when I was 16 um my sister went away to college I mean I really didn't spend time with my family at all and especially my sister we were in two different realms she was I never saw her and um she wasn't in that gang but she wasn't close to the Lord either but she went away to college and there was an university. She got phew, wholly into the kingdom and is still radical. She goes to Walmart all the time sharing Jesus um, where she lives. I love my sister. And um, so she came back at Thanksgiving and asked if I would go to church with her. And I'm standing in the door praying. I prayed about everything. Should I go or not? And then I felt like I should go. Well, after a few months of going, it was a little evangelical free church in Parkville. Uh, I did not look, I mean, I looked like the times, that were, you know, the short skirts, the makeup and all, and uh, they were, the, these girls were like skirts down to here, this was, seven, this was like, anyway, I was like, these people I can't really relate to, but they were preaching the word of God, and I just kept going back and going back, and finally, January 10th, 1971, they kept singing, Just As I Am, and there's somebody here that needs to give their life to Christ, and I finally go down. I was like, okay, I, I need to give, I'm crying, and, and uh, but at the same time, it was a little bit like the uh, seed that was put on the sidewalk and strangled. I write immediately, how can I face my friends now? This is really radical, and um, so it was sort of a... Um, I'll, I want Jesus, but I want this. I want him. So I started, think, uh, no, not yet. Anyway, what's, I forgot the next picture. Um, so, uh, oh, yeah, and I was very aware. I really felt like a tumbleweed. I mean, this kid, I would go, I'd get up early in the morning and go out in the woods when I was a kid and just sit still at 5.30 in the morning before school and watch the animals start to come up to me. And I was like, what happened to that person? I am like this 
you know, re just every kind of wild adventure you can imagine I wanted to do. And uh, I thought, I don't know, I lost myself somewhere along the way. And I, I just, it scared me. I thought, I'm a tumbleweed. I don't have a foundation anymore in my life. And um, uh, my grades weren't good. I quit going to school. I just uh, played pool, worked on my tan, whatever. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really important things. I thought I'm really wasting my life here. I have no future. Graduate from high school, and uh, yeah, I mean, my grades were not hot. I was not like top pick for any college. Thank God, my grandfather. This was the hand of the Lord. I think I prayed about it once. Lord, let me go to college. Oh, and at the same time too, I'm I'm trying to live a Christian life. So I get up every morning. I'm praying. Um, I read. It's seven minutes with God. Do the ad adoration. Uh, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. Okay, five minutes. I got two more minutes to go. Okay, and then I can go out to the, have my cigarettes and smoke pot and everything. So, um, but I'm witnessing to people. I'm fasting. I, I mean, I'm really like a double double life here. And I think something I remembered standing in the parking lot originally at this, you know, I'm standing there talking to this guy about how he needs Jesus. And he goes, how come you're, so you got a bottle of Boone's Farm in your hand and you're telling me about Jesus. So I was like, well, you know, uh, okay, well, that's, you know, on the side, you can still love Jesus. But I mean, it was, a, and he died of an overdose a few months later. I was crushed. I was like, Lord, if I'd been really a real Christian, maybe he would have received my message. And, uh, and um, yeah, like the girlfriend up the street, she ended up in federal penitentiary. Nobody's ever heard from her for 30 years. God, I, I mean, I don't know why does he pick, choose us. I don't know why he chose to save me. But my grandfather got an honorary doctor degree that summer, July, in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. I, he got me in. Of course, I'm sure he gave lots of money to the <laughs> university. The president writes me, we'd love to have you here. <laughs> So, I mean, I'm down in Ocean City in a big, in a house that was, I mean, some apartment that was going to get de demolished, um, smoking pot and weren't waking up. And I was, oh, yeah, I'm going to Sioux Falls, South Dakota tomorrow. And <laughs> jump in the plane and arrive somewhere like a hundred years ago. My best friend had a, lived on a 40-acre farm. I went to visit her. They had no indoor plumbing. We used an outhouse. And uh, we had a well. There was a well to get the water. There was, <laughs> and, um, it was South Dakota, it's six months of the year, you're that much snow on the ground. I was like, oh my word. And the kids, there was, it was a whole, it was a Baptist church, Baptist college, and the Holy Spirit fell on that place. It was very uh, controversial, but he did. He didn't care they were Baptists. <laughs> and, and then, uh, you know, in the first month, I'm still kind of tripping around, and then somebody invites me to a, a revival meeting, and here, Thank God for Mr. Aubrey McGann. This preacher, I still, I tried to find, I found him years later just to tell him how thankful I was for somebody preaching the word. He's, he's preaching and he's looking right at me. And he's like, if you've fallen into this and this and this and this. And I was like, how does he know me? <laughs> and as soon as he gave a call to come forward, I came running up and he prayed over me. He goes, ma'am, he goes, would you, if you died right now, would you go to heaven? I go, well, uh, I gave my life to Christ, I think I would, but the way I'm living, I don't think I would, but I think he goes, you need to know, <laughs> you need to know, and so he prayed over me, and my life was upheaval, <laughs> everything, everything forever changed, wow. thank you, Jesus, <laughs> resurrected, he totally crushed that, I was like, the crucifixion, actually, you know, in Galatians, it even talks about the kind of life as you yield freely and fully to the dynamic life and power of the Holy Spirit, you will abandon the cravings of your self-life, for your self-life craves the things that offend the Holy Spirit and hinder you from living free within you. And his intense cravings hinder your old self-life from dominating you, so then the two incompatible and conflicting forces within you are your self-life of the flesh and the new creation life of the spirit. Thank God. I, it was like a five-year war over my life, and he won. I thank you, Lord, that he won. Yes. So, all right. Um, so wrap this up. <laughs> uh, I, I, I just have to say that. I mean, my, totally. I, 
it was before Thanksgiving. I wasn't scheduled to go home for Thanksgiving, but I, it was a miracle. I was able to go, and I, it totally, he transformed. I just wanted to be with my family. I grieved over those five years that I had rejected them. I, first time I got a bonus, I went back to the stores in Towson and gave them back. I made a covenant. I would never, I wouldn't ever, you know, lie again. And um, uh, everything he was transforming uh, just doing this work of me that I just love. And I was like the craziest person on campus. But Bible studies, we got to have a, let's get up early in the morning. Let's stay up late at night. I was part of the, evangel uh, the uh, discipleship group Friday nights. Let's go out evangelizing every Saturday. Everything that was said, everything that was happening, I was part of. Then I remembered I was there to study too. So uh, I did end up uh, becoming a good student again. Thank the Lord. But it was, um, I think there was two things that, it's a miserable life if to try to live here, where you're listening to this, you're, you're being tossed, and it's, it's miserable. Being tossed like, oh, I can live a little bit in the world. It's, that's a travesty. Jesus gave everything, everything, so we would be all his. He has a glorious, glorious future, and it, it involves pain. He used pain in my life to bring me to him, and he still does. I, I made a covenant also. I would respond with joy no matter what the circumstances were, everything. I see so many people get bitter because of something. You know, my mother died or this happened or that, and then they, they leave Christ. I was like, you're kidding. That's his discipline. We give, we, thank you, Lord, for your discipline. You love us enough to bring us to yourself. God, let us, we just, we say, Lord, I just, um, whatever you need to give us to sanctify us. I'm still in the process of being sanctified, folks, that's for sure. And um, so when he's pulverizing me, I just said, through tears, just thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord. And um, he all, and he broke that whole spell of me of trying to be pleasing to my friends. And he has had me stand up to whew, pretty powerful, authoritative people that were in the wrong and stand up to them. And they were, they changed and they repented. And I just thank God he gave me boldness too. And I just pray for anyone who has people in your family, or if you are not fully in Jesus Christ, you will give yourself fully to him today. There's no, there's no, it just keeps getting better and better. He is so worth everything, every loss in our lives to have Jesus is the crowning glory, the, the, to be restored to the Heavenly Father and know his love. And I can always say, I am accepted in the beloved. When he sees me, I'm in Jesus. So when I'm, people reject me, it doesn't matter. I am in Jesus. I'm accepted in him. Praise God. Bless you. Yes, Lynn. Lynn, you definitely have holy chutzpah <laughs> and holy passion. You know, actually, you know, I, I've known Lynn for, I think, 50 years maybe. And, and I heard things this morning I never knew. So I, see, see, I thought you were born holy. <laughs> All right. Well, turn to somebody and say, you know, Jesus is amazing. <clears throat> yes, he is. He truly is. Well, good to see you all. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Well, we want to prepare ourselves for communion, which we do once a month, usually at the last Sunday of the month. And um, <clears throat> as we prepare ourselves, you may, you may remember the story in uh, Luke chapter 24, where uh, Jesus is revealed to these two disciples in the breaking of bread, which is what we're going to do in a few moments. And um, you may remember the backdrop to the story. You know, these two disciples, they're on the road to Emmaus, and they're talking with each other. And this guy walks up, and he says, hey, guys, what are you talking about? So they said, you don't know what happened in Jerusalem? You know, this guy we thought was to be the Messiah. We thought he was going to redeem Israel, but he got crucified. And, and like, we're really sad. And so Jesus uh, kind of converses a little bit more with them. And they're going on about, you know, gee, I wish we really thought he was the right guy. And Jesus says, finally, you foolish guys, come on. Don't you know? And then he shares with them the scriptures that speak of himself. And then they get to the house in Emmaus. And Jesus was going to walk by, keep going. They said, yo, whoa, 
Come on, wait, we need to hear more about this. Can you have a lunch with us? They, they still don't know who he is. And then as they broke bread, this man who was in their midst was revealed to them. It was Jesus. So we read, pick up on verse 28. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He appeared to be going further, but they constrained him saying, stay with us for it is toward evening and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And he vanished out of their sight. And they said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road? Did not our hearts burn within us as he talked to us on the road? I think, Bob, your heart was burning a little bit this morning. See, I think the Holy Spirit's coming to us in these days because he's, vid he's visiting us to put in us a, a consuming fire that would renew, that would fan a flame, and we would renew our, our passion and our devotion to Jesus. So as we prepare ourselves, you know, see, communion can become ritualistic. You know, we just kind of do it. The Holy Spirit doesn't want that to happen to you. So as we listen to this song, I want us to pray that the Holy Spirit would come and that he would move in our hearts and he would renew our hearts, a holy passion where our hearts burn again with love, renewed love, passionate love for him. So Holy Spirit, we, uh, we welcome you. We are here. You've been here all morning. And what I ask as we listen to this song, Spirit of God, that you would fill our hearts this morning with an all-consuming love.
Jesus, we do ask that you would have your way in us. That you would be an all-consuming fire in us. And Lord, we know that we can't make anything happen. We can't change our hearts. We can't work it up. But you can work in us by your Spirit in us. So we yield, we surrender. We say, Holy Spirit, fill me, saturate me, Consume me with the heart of Jesus. And we ask, Lord, as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup this morning, that you would, that our eyes would be opened in the breaking of bread. Jesus, we would see you anew, see you afresh see you as real, alive, and active in our lives, changing us, transforming us from glory to glory. And this is the work of the Lord, who is the Spirit. So, if you have your, does anybody need a cup and a communion cup? And raise your hand if you need one, if you don't have one. Awesome. <clears throat> we read Matthew chapter 26. When the hour came, Jesus and his disciples reclined at the table. And he said to them, I've eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink it again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, I, in the same way after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. So I'd like to invite you to please stand and join with me in this prayer of sanctification and consecration. Together, let's say, Lord Jesus, thank you for giving your life for us, for taking upon yourself our sin, our sorrow, and sickness. Thank you for your burning heart of love that led you to a cross I come before you now that you would consume me, fill me, and bathe me in your love. Thank you that I have been born again, that my heart may burn again. In your name I pray. Amen. You may be seated.
Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never hunger again. Whoever believes in me will never thirst again. So if you could hold up your bread, please. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth, the bread of heaven, the body of Christ, broken for you. Amen. Thank you. Jesus. If you haven't already, remove the plastic cover. Hold up your cup, please. <clears throat> Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has created the fruit of the vine and has given us this cup for our salvation, for our redemption. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible tells us that if we're in Christ, then we are not only co-crucified and co-risen, but we are co-victorious. So as we close this morning, I just had a sense that the Holy Spirit wants to just do one kind of final thing with us. And, um, you know, Jesus has given us the victory over, as we just prayed, over sin and sorrow and sickness. This morning, if, if, you're, if you're struggling with... Um, what the Bible calls a besetting sin, something that, you know, you've repented of and you've, you, you don't like and, you, and you, you want it to go and you just, you just want to be rid of it, but it's still hanging on. The Holy Spirit's here this morning to give you victory. Or a sorrow, a something that's caused you great sorrow and you just can't get rid of the grief. The Holy Spirit is here this morning to help you overcome ungodly sorrow grief that he wants to lift from you. And sickness. Some of you this morning are dealing with some form of physical or emotional illness, sickness. Jesus took your sicknesses with him upon the cross. So if any of those apply to you, if you could just put your hands out like this. It's a way of saying, I'm open. I want to pray for you. and myself. <laughs> Jesus, we declare this morning that you are the victor king. That you died, you were buried, and you rose from the dead, victorious over sin, sickness, Satan, sorrow, death itself. It's the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' mighty name, I release your power, your presence, and your power right now. Yes. Spirit of God, right now, touch each person whose hands are raised before you in faith, saying, I receive. I receive the victory that you've won for me. I receive the, the power of your spirit invading my body right now to give me, to make me an overcomer in Jesus' name, to give me the victory in Jesus' name. I receive and I thank you for that right now, Holy Spirit because of the blood of Christ, because of the person, the mighty name of Jesus, the Son of God, Jesus the Christ. And I thank you and I praise you for your goodness and your love for me. In Jesus' name. We are more than conquerors through him who loves us. Amen? Yeah. Amen. All right, well, let's, um, Bob, come on up. But before we do, let's uh, tell you here's what we'll do. We'll have a final 
blessing. Who is the final? Bl who is the? Paul. Come on up, Paul. So Paul will say the blessing, and then and then Bob will give us some more instructions. So let's point, let's stand, please. Iva Rekha Duna Vadish Madecha Ya here Adonai Panavalecha Vihuneka Isa Adonai Panavalecha Vayasem Lecha Shalom. The Lord bless you, keep you. The Lord shine his face upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his shalom, his peace, which passes all understanding. In Jesus Yeshua's name, all God's people said, Amen, amen. and Amen. amen. God bless you, and if you're not able to stay, have a great day. For those who can stay, here's Bob. Those of you sitting on this side, standing on this side, move over to this side, please. And if I could have a few people to help, thank you. <laughs>